today I'm going to speak on the resurrection of Jesus Christ, for it is the essential message of Christianity and the very principle that it's founded upon. And we serve a risen Savior, and I'm so thankful for that. While on the cross, there were seven sayings that Jesus uttered while on the cross, and I want to take a look at them for just a moment and then concentrate on what followed just days later. So the first part of the message, I want to just share what those seven sayings were. We're going to be looking at different passages of Scripture to look at the conversation that really was taking place while in prayer while he was on the cross. And uh, they come, you know, we're going to be looking at all the Gospels with us and then as well as Psalm 22. But if you look with me at these seven sayings from the cross, the first one is found in Luke chapter 23. So if you would take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 23. Just for a moment, I'm going to read kind of the different key phrases from the Gospels. I'm going to be kind of looking at all four Gospels. But in Luke chapter 23 and verse 34, it says this. Verse 33 actually says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they do. If you remember, I spoke on this a while back. Father, forgive them. And there are several people involved in it. But it really was a word for a word of intercession. He was praying for those who were causing problems and pain. It was a plea to the Father to forgive those responsible for his death. And if you remember, there were a lot of people there during that time frame. There was a crowd. The idea behind the crowd was that there were numerous people who... Uh, there were numerous people who didn't, you know, you don't have to stand out while you're in the crowd. You can just kind of blend in. You don't have to be the one that's calling the shots. You just can simply blend in and do whatever it is that you want to do. So the reality is, it was the crowd that he was praying that there might be forgiveness for. Number two, there was also, uh, not only the crowd, but there was Pilate and Herod. And there were those around him. You know, Pilate and Herod both said, hey, I don't find anything guilty in this man, yet let's Give in to what the crowd wants. You know, Pilate said over and over, I find no reason to bring charges against him. Herod was all excited because he thought, well, you know, I've heard about all the rumors. I've heard about all the miracles he's done. I've heard about the very things, you know, that, you know, that make him stand out within the crowd. And he was hoping that, well, maybe, maybe just if I'm lucky enough, I might be able to catch him do something miraculous. I might see some of the magic that he performs. And yet in the end, he says, ah, I'm not going to see anything. I might as well just send him back to Pilate. And once again, nobody found anything worthy of death within him. And then, of course, you got the chief priests and the scribes. You know, the chief priests were the religious ones, and the scribes were the religious ones, the ones that knew the law, the Old Testament, inside and out. And yet, even they, they were upset. And, and even in their anger and their, in their frustration, Jesus was crying out to his Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then, of course, there were the soldiers that mocked and railed him. And then, of course, the thieves that were on either side. And, and the one thief says, listen, we are guilty. We deserve this. And yet he goes, if you are God, save yourself and us. And so even as all these people were around him, and people that we can even find a little picture of ourselves in, Jesus Christ was crying out for their forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. It was a word of intercession. He bore the sins of the world that forgiveness might be received. Isn't that amazing? Even in the pain that he was going through, the agony that he was going through, the prayer was not for himself. It was for others. And it was for what they needed, not necessarily what they wanted. Then the second word from the cross is found in verses 39 through 41. In verse 39 it says, the one of the, Then one of the criminals were hanged, blaspheming him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God? seeing you are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And when, when he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, and here's the second word that he said, and Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. It was a word of compassion. Even in his dying, he was fulfilling what he claimed to, that he came to do in John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. You remember the verse, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. He goes on and tells that Jesus did not come into the world, condemn the world, what, what? But that the world through him might be 
saved. Even in his dying, he was bringing life to those who were around him. It was a word of compassion. And you know what? Here's the amazing thing. Even though this took place centuries ago, it's still true today that Jesus has still come to save you and I. He still come to offer salvation to those who put their faith and trust in him. So that's a blessing to look forward to. And then the word, third word is found in John chapter 19. So if you would take your Bibles and turn over to the next book, John chapter 19. And we're going to look at verses 25 through 27. Verse 25 says this, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. The third word was, Behold your son is a word of concern for his earthly mother. You know, every uh, and you, at, this, at this moment, as Jesus was going through the pangs of death and, and agony and the suffering on the cross, uh, Mary was also suffering. She was watching her son die. Can you imagine? I, I, I can't fathom in my own mind what it would be like to watch my own child, the one that I cared for. Even though he was the son of God, it was still her child, right? And can you imagine watching your own child go through the pain and the suffering that he went through? And I'm sure she was going through a bit of her own suffering as she watched. But even in his dying, his concern was not for himself. Some have commented that he called her woman so as to lessen the hurt of calling her mother. But you know, it's an amazing thing that if you look in the historical sense of the word woman, it was not a derogatory wor- word as we would, might think it is today. Today, if your spouse or your husband would say, woman, you know, we would probably get a little frustrated, a little upset with that. But in that day and age, it was not a derogatory term. In fact, it was a term of endearment. It was a term of respect. Woman. You know, how, how times have changed and we have made words that have once held weight and beauty to be something derogatory. And yet he called her woman. And then not only that, he was even taking care of her even on the cross. He says, woman, behold thy son. And then he looked at John, I believe, and looked at him and says, take care of her. And so from that day, Mary went on to be taken care of by John. So even in his dying on the cross, it was not for himself. It was for others around him, and especially his mother. The first, fourth word comes from the book of Mark. So if you go back to the first, uh, second gospel, Matthew, then chapter, uh, Mark chapter uh, 15. Mark chapter 15 and verse 34. He says, then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. Even to this, stay here and watch. You know, he's in the garden. And he goes on in chapter, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 14, 15, verse 34. Excuse me, verse 34 says this. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The fourth word that he uttered was, Why have you forsaken me? It was a word of abandonment. He was in enormous physical pain and agony. And yet, God had turned his back on him as he bore the sins of the world, according to Matthew chapter 27, verse 46. It's amazing that God, who knew no sin, right? who came and is tempted in every way like you and I, yet without sin, gave his life. And God had to turn his back on him because he would bear on himself the sins of the world. And he could only be the only one that could do that because he was the only one that was sinless. He was the only one that could be that spotless lamb without blemish. He was the only one that could be the propitiation for our sins. He was the only one that could pay the price. And as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He was made to be sin for us who knew no sin. He did that because he loved us. Because he loved you and I. In the fifth phrase on the cross, we see something a little more personal. And if you add up all these stories, it was the the, the sequence of what he was saying in prayer as he was on the cross. But the fifth phrase that he uttered was in John chapter 19 and verse 28. 
where he says this, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. I thirst. It's a word of personal desire. He'd been driven to the point of exhaustion. And the words demonstrate his humanity. And we've said it many times that Jesus Christ demonstrated his humanity by leaving the splendor of heaven, by taking on the limitations of the flesh, and coming down to this earth. So, well, what are the limitations? Not only did he thirst, but we also know that he hungered, that he emotionally wept when Lazarus died. His Bible tells us in John 11 that he, that he wept for his friend Lazarus. He was an emotional person. He was a physical person. But yet, he'd been driven to the point of exhaustion. And these were actually the words fulfilled in Psalm chapter 22, verse 15, and in Psalm 69, 21. He said he was thirst, but here's, here's what I do know. In the midst of his thirst, I don't know about you, but when I'm thirsty, I want something that's going to quench that thirst. I would like water. You know, there are times I want a sip of Diet Mountain Dew, but I want water, cold water, when I'm thirsty, when I've been working, when I've been sweating, when I'm exhausted, I want water. And what they gave Jesus was vinegar on a hyssop. And if you know anything about the hyssop, if you've done any research about that, if you almost think of it as a small, look like almost like chafes of wheat, but yet more bristly, more dry than that, dipped in what they call gall or vinegar, and then lifted to his lips. The last thing it would do is satisfy thirst. The last thing it would do is quench his desire. And if you've read anything about the account of Jesus dying on the cross, it was very painful in the sense that every time that he wanted to breathe, he had to lift up. And of course, to lift himself up, he had the nails that were crossed through his feet. And to push down and the nails to lift himself up to breathe. And of course, his hands. And as the nails were in there, he had to lift himself up to breathe. And nothing was satisfying his thirst and his anguish. And they give him sour vinegar. And with that, we come to the sixth phrase in John chapter 19, verse 30, where it says this. So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. This was a word of completion. What he came to do, suffer, but never suffer again. To pay the price, but to never owe it again. To demonstrate his humility. In fact, take your Bibles and turn just for a moment to the book of Philippians chapter 2. Read this just for a moment. Be familiar with it once again. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, and if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfilling my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing but be done through strife or, or through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than yourselves. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And then he goes on to give us the mind, the humility that was in Jesus Christ. Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In humility, he left the splendor of heaven to come down to earth and then to be able to proclaim, it is finished. He completed the task that he was sent to earth to do. He paid a price, as someone said, that he didn't know because we had a debt we could not pay. God and man were finally reconciled together through this one act on the cross. And the plan for mankind for the ages was now complete. Man now has a responsibility to respond to the Spirit's working in his life. And then while on the cross, he uttered one more phrase. 
And it comes from Luke chapter 23. So back to the book in Luke chapter 23. And in verse 46. Actually, verse 44. It says, Now it was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. Then the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was torn in two. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. So the last and final word is, Father, into your hands I command my spirit, is a word of conclusion. Jesus dismisses his spirit into his Father's hands. It was not an ordinary death. Why? Because it was voluntary. Yes, there were soldiers that laid him on the cross and nailed his hands and feet into the wood. But you know what? I don't think they had to fight him to lay down. He voluntarily laid down his life. He sacrificially gave it. And as one song stated, no man did take his life. He willingly laid it down a sacrifice. He did that because he loved you and I. It was not an ordinary death. It was voluntary. Number two, the motivation behind this death was what? Love. You see, the other thieves on either side of them, they died because they were guilty of crimes. The one thief admitted such. And yet, his was love for the mankind of the world. A sacrificial death like none other before or since. Now, if you would, take for your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 28 just for a few moments. I want to concentrate here just for a moment. And this is the reason we get to celebrate Easter. So if you would follow along as I read Matthew 28, verses 1 through 6. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. Come see the place where, he, where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. But notice that verse 6. For he is risen. He is not here, for he is risen. Jesus is dead and buried in a borrowed tomb. As custom was, they would wait several days. And, you know, here's the idea behind waiting several days. There's no doubt that he was dead. He wasn't in a coma. He wasn't just sleeping because of the pain he was going through. You see, after three days, it was concrete that he was gone. His spirit had left him. In fact, his word tells us that. He says, Father, into thy, my, your, thy hands I commend my spirit. He had given up the ghost. He had passed away. You see, it was also custom during the day to break the legs of those who died on the cross. Why? So they could not lift themselves up any longer. So that they could not breathe, but they did not need to do that with Jesus. In fact, it was prophesied that not a bone would be broken. Prophecy fulfilled. They didn't have to break his bones because he had died. It was obvious to all he had died. And they laid him in a borrowed tomb. And Mary Magdalene and the other Mary had come to anoint his body with fragrances. The only problem was they got to the tomb and he was not there. And of course, they were met after this great earthquake, by an angel. So a great earthquake happens. The angel of the Lord descends from heaven and rolls back the stone from the door of the tomb and then sits on that stone that he's just rolled away. You say, what in the world? Why would the angel sit on a stone? Has anyone ever thought about that? I, I, this is just my own surmise. I, this is, I mean, my own opinion. If I had to sit there and try to figure it out, I don't know that I could figure out just the right answer. But this is my opinion. What if the guards, being in fear that they had not been, they been accused of not doing their job, decided to go get a few of their comrades or their cronies and say, let's get this stone back in place? Makes for a good story. We can't let everybody know that the body's gone. We can't let everybody know. They'll think that we didn't do our job. They'll send us to prison. 
They'll kill us for letting this body, the most prominent figure of their day, all of a sudden he's gone. You know what I think? I think he sat on the stone, and what was his command to the Marys? Go tell everybody. So the angel, I just happen to think, and this is my own opinion, that maybe he sat on that stone so that nobody could roll it back in place. And given the people an opportunity to find out that this Jesus, who was prophesied to come back to life, is actually back to life. Isn't that amazing? God had a plan. Always has a plan. So the presence of the angel frightens the guards, and they shook and became as dead men. I think they were scared out of their mind. That exactly the scenario I just pointed out as the possibility would be the possibility. And then the angel begins to speak in verse 5. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. So he brings him inside and says, this is where he was, but he's not here any longer. Isn't that a cool? Can you imagine? I, I'd love to have been the mouse in the cave at that moment. I'd love to have been the fly in the wall, right? Mary, what are we going to do? I, I, I don't know, but you know, I'm sure they had a million emotions going through their mind, a million thoughts that were just crisscrossing their brains. And yet he was not there. I'm just thinking out loud, maybe, maybe you do this once in a while, but I, I don't think the stone that was in front of the door was a little stone. I don't think, I mean, if, if there was some you know, conspiracy theory to move the stone, it would have taken an army of people to do it. But we know that Scripture was fulfilled. And God worked. And Jesus had rose from the grave. You know, those who understood the Scriptures and were expecting a Messiah, well, there were many around at that time of Jesus who remembered what the Old Testament prophets had foretold. Simeon, when Jesus is presented at the temple, talked about it. Anna, also at the temple, talked about it. Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist in Luke 1, talked about it. And of course, John the Baptist in John 1, 29, he talked about it. It was prophesied that the Messiah would come. Many wanted an earthly king, but that was not the purpose of Jesus. Could he have done it? Oh, I'm certain he had the power to. He had the wisdom to, but that wasn't his desire. That's not why he came. He came to give life and salvation to those who put their faith and trust in him alone. So not everywhere written in the Old Testament is explicit, but there's enough written to paint a clear picture of who Jesus would be and what he would be like. We read that in Psalm chapter 22. It's a great example. And maybe I had to take some time this season to read through Psalm chapter 22. But God brought everyone together. And he would be the man who would finish what he started. I don't know about you, but the very purpose for which he came to this earth was fulfilled. But here's the thing. It's still being fulfilled. What he came to do in offering salvation for the lost and dying of the world, he's still doing. And I don't know about you, but the question that each of us needs to come to is the question of whether or not we truly have put our faith and trust in him, in his finished work on the cross of Calvary. It's the greatest decision that any one of us could ever make. You know, at the end of the day, how will you be remembered? How will you be remembered as far as Easter? You know, every year we, we come to this time point and uh, our, our, our adult kids act like little kids. They won't admit it, but they do. You see, every year I still grab the eggs and we hide them in our backyard. And uh, now, now Dad puts a little bit of cash in a few of them. And so now it's like, Every year they want to find the gold egg because the gold egg is always the one that's got the cash in it, right? And so I hide them pretty, pretty significantly. Well, some of them. You know, I think Jake and David and, you know, Annie, they kind of get to the point where it's like, well, if it's obvious, that ain't the one. You know, that's the one that candy has, you know, there's candy in it. We don't want that one. You know, 
we all have our traditions, the things that we do, because it's associated with the holidays that we love. You know, I'm pretty certain that maybe in 100 years we may not have that tradition anymore. Nobody's going to look back and say, well, I, I wish I could just go out and find the golden egg that had the cash in it. I don't think anybody's going to come to that conclusion anymore. But a hundred years from now, a thousand years from now, a million years from now, we're still going to know about Jesus. We're still going to remember that Easter is all about what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. The fact that he went through the cross of Calvary. That he went through the pain and the suffering. That he gave his life in sacrifice so that you and I might know Jesus as our Savior. That's the most important thing we need to remember about Easter. And the most important thing that each and every one of us needs to take into consideration personally is whether or not we know him. Do we know him? Not just do we know about him. You see, God's word makes it very clear that there will be many people in that day who say, well, Father, or Jesus, have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done miracles in your name? And what will he say? Depart from me, for I never knew you. The bottom line is, see, we, a lot of us treat Jesus as a, a factual person of history. Maybe he lived, I mean, he's a name on a piece of paper in a page of a book, but he's more than that. He's alive. And he, because he's alive, he lives and so can we for all eternity. You see, here's the other thing. See, we're all going to live for eternity. Every one of us in this room. The question is not whether or not we'll live for eternity. The question is where we will live for eternity. You see, not everyone who dies is going to spend eternity in heaven. Many people will die and spend eternity in hell. Because God's word makes that clear as well. Except a man be born again. Except a man put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ. He cannot see the kingdom of heaven. See, that's what Easter is about? Yes. Jesus Christ came. He lived. He died. And he rose again so that you and I might have eternal life with him in glory one day. I don't know if you've ever done that. You say, well, how does that even happen? Let me tell you how it doesn't happen. Some of you, you only come to church a couple times a year because it's Easter, it's Christmas, it's something special. You know, my grandchild is being baptized or, or, or christened or, or dedicated or whatever it is that you do that's somewhat religious that brings you out to church. Going to church will not, in, will not give you any merit to enter heaven's gate. How do I know that? Because God's word says, by, not by works of righteousness which I have done, but according to his mercy he saves us. In Ephesians 2, 9, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if I can be faithful coming to church every single day of my life, or if I were wealthy and I were to give most of my... My, my, my monetary wealth and my, my goods to feed the poor and to build hospitals and to educate in schools and to, to just help those who are impoverished doesn't matter. I can be the nicest person that God has ever created and put on this earth. But unless I know Jesus, unless I have a relationship with him and I put my faith and trust in him, heaven is not going to be my home. I didn't say that. I wish I could change that. I wish I could just say, you know what? Let's just get rid of that. You get to go to heaven. Wouldn't that be awesome? That's just not how it works. God has established a plan, and the plan was through his son Jesus on the cross. So it's not by anything I can do, because if I can do it, I don't need Jesus. If I can get to heaven apart from him by my good works, by my kindness, by my giving away of what I've got, by being faithful to church and helping the church and giving to the church and joining the church, if I can do anything, Jesus died in vain. You say, well, then how does that happen? God's word is so clear, and I'm so thankful. And he says, you know what? This is how much factual hope you can have. 1 John 5 says, These things have I written unto you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. He didn't say hope. He didn't say think. He didn't say wish. He said, These things have I written unto you who believe that you may know that you have eternal life. And he says, this is what it is. Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Am I willing to acknowledge that I'm a sinner? I don't know about you. You ask anyone around you, you know me long enough, you know that I'm a sinner. I have to confess that. I couldn't hide it if I tried. 
And by the way, neither can you. God's word is clear. Everything we do, God says, is naked and open before him in Hebrews 4. Psalm 103, it says, no matter where I go, I can, you know, Jesus is there. I can't hide my sin. I might be able to hide it from my wife or my husband. I can hide it from my kids. I can hide it from my employer. I can hide it from my relatives. I can hide it from my neighbors. But I cannot hide it from God. We're all sinners. Are you willing to acknowledge that? That's the first thing. B, I don't have to stay in that sin. B is to believe. What it, believe what? That Jesus Christ did exactly what he said he did on the cross. He shed his blood that we might have forgiveness of sins. And God's word tells us in Hebrews chapter 11, for without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He made it clear. I shed my blood so that the sin of mankind would be covered. Am I willing to acknowledge that I'm a sinner? Am I willing to believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sin? And then let us see there's two things. Confess my sin. Lord, forgive me of my sin. I ask you to forgive me for my sin. And I call on you to be my Savior. You say, what's the importance of that? Romans 10, 9, 10, and 13 says this. For with a heart one believes, but with a mouth confession is made unto salvation. So people can believe. Say, well, isn't that just enough to believe? No, it's really not. Without the confession, the belief is not enough. Here's why. The devils also believe and tremble. Are there going to be devils in heaven? Nope. So it's not just enough to believe. I need to believe, says, with the heart one believes, but with the mouth confession is made. I'm willing to confess, Lord, I need you. I call on you. And here's the thing. Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's not for the elite. It's not for the gifted. It's not just for the poor or for the rich or for those who are intellectually wise and academic or for those who don't know much. It's for the world. Any one of us has the potential to say, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Christ died on the cross for my sin. And I'm willing to call on him and say, God, forgive me. And I call on you to be my Savior. I put my faith and trust in you alone. And on that merit, God's word says I can become a child of God, destined for heaven and in a relationship with him for all eternity. That's the story of Easter, folks. Uh, we can have fun with the chocolate bunny rabbits and the Easter baskets and the fun around the family table. Nothing wrong with that. But the true story of Easter is that Jesus came to die. But he didn't stay dead. He arose. And here's the thing. Romans 1.16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. He says, I don't want to be ashamed of this. I will boldly and proudly stand up as a child of God, knowing that my faith and trust is in him alone. That's the most important thing that any one of us could ever um, consider is whether or not we truly know Jesus. And if you don't know him, I would challenge you this morning to put your faith and trust in Jesus. You say, well, how do I do that? It's a simple prayer of faith. It's just a simple prayer. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to go to Bible college or learn how to pray. It's just simply talking to God like you talk to your neighbor, friend, coworker, child, whatever. It's just simple conversation. Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe that you died on the cross to do that. And I call on you to be my Savior. I put my faith and trust in you alone. It's a simple prayer of faith. If you've never done that, I would encourage you to do that today. And I promise you, Easter will take on a whole new meaning for you. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come before you and to, to look at your word and to know that all these things that you said on the cross, Lord, for our, for our learning, that, Lord, you prayed, Father, forgive them. Past, present, future, Lord, that you offered forgiveness. Lord, you offered a prayer of compassion. Uh, today, you'll be with me in paradise. And that same promise can be made to everyone in this room who does not know you, that today they can have that assurance of knowing that they'll spend eternity in heaven. And, Lord, we know that you are concerned for your mother, Lord, and it just says we have to be concerned for those around us. Lord, you are concerned that your father had turned his back on you, and yet, Lord, you had him turn his back on you so that we could be saved. And Lord, you said, I thirst. 
and yet they mistreated you and gave you sour wine. And Lord, how often do we do that? We don't give you what you deserve. But Lord, I pray that we would. And Lord, you said it is finished. And Lord, we know that what you did is completed. And then Lord, you commended your spirit into the Father's hand. And Lord, one day, as your word tells us, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to realize that this is a serious moment. It's a moment that you've offered to us, Lord, to know you, to have a relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray that as our heads are bowed, Lord, that you would just work in our hearts to draw those that need to know you to yourself, Father. For just a moment, as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, just ask for a moment, no one be looking around. Every Sunday, just give you a quick opportunity to respond to what you've heard this morning. Maybe you're here this morning and say, well, Pastor, that is not what I thought of in coming to church this morning concerning Easter. It's not what I was thinking of. But maybe through the message, you've come to realize that this is what Easter is. Maybe God has spoken to you and you say, well, Pastor, if I'm honest with myself, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that I'm spending eternity in heaven. Listen, it's not a, something you have to do over and over and over again. Is you don't have to keep getting saved. You don't have to keep praying and say, God, save me again. But the moment I realize that I'm a sinner, that Christ died for my sins, and I ask him to forgive me and I put my faith and trust in what he's done, it's done. I have a relationship with him. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, that's new for me. I don't know much about that. But I want to put my faith and trust in Jesus alone. Say, I'm not sure if I were to die today. I don't know for sure I'd spend eternity in heaven, but I'm concerned. Listen, I won't embarrass you and I'll call you out, but would you just simply lift your hand or look at me just so I can pray for you? And I'll call you out and not embarrass you. But you say, I'm concerned. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that? Would you just make eye contact with me? Acknowledge that just for a moment so that I can pray for you. Okay. So maybe this morning you say, well, Pastor, I know Jesus. I have a relationship with him. You know, Jesus Christ came and died on the cross for all mankind. What are you doing with that gift that he's given to you? Are you hoarding it away? You say, well, I got my salvation. Ain't nobody can steal it from me. But neither does anyone else have access to it. Are you sharing it with others? Are you sharing that hope that you've been given with others? Say, Pastor, if I'm honest with myself this morning, God knows my heart. I've been kind of hoarding it away. I need to share that, that hope, that treasure that God has given to us in salvation. Would you pray for me? Anyone like that? Yes. Yes. Can I challenge you? Ask God for opportunities. He'll give them to you. You've got been given the greatest gift that, that could be ever given. Don't hoard it. Present it. When you've got something of value, you want to show it. The greatest thing that we own as a child of God is salvation. And there's enough of it to go around. Share it. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for the opportunity to, to have this time to celebrate the story and meaning of Easter. The fact that you didn't stay dead. You didn't stay in the grave. You arose. And we're so grateful for that. We're so thankful for that. The fact that we get to serve a risen Savior, a living Savior, a powerful Savior. Lord, I do pray, Lord, though no one raise their hand, I pray there be one here today that does not know you as their Savior. Might say it be a day of salvation for them. Help them to know that I'm available to talk with them, to share Jesus with them. But Lord, for the rest of us, I pray that we would cherish the gift that you gave to us in salvation. But not only cherish it, Lord, that we would share it with those that need to hear the message. Lord, be with each one of us, Lord, who raise our hand and hearts toward you today. Lord, that we'd be faithful to be able to give an answer of the hope that lies within us, as it says in 1 Peter 3. Lord, draw us close to you. Work in our hearts. Thank you for each one that's here today. For it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.